Right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined by Natalie Nixon, who is across the other side of the country in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. How are you doing, Natalie? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me, John. Yeah, and Natalie, who is a PhD, so it's Dr. Natalie Nixon, <laughs> is a is a creativity strategist, global keynote speaker, and author, and president of Figure Eight Thinking. She advises leaders on transformation by applying wonder and rigor to amplify growth and business value. And that's what I kind of wanted to talk to uh, uh, today about uh, with you, Natalie. Is this idea of r rigor and um, uh, rigor and creativity uh, so uh, wonder and rigor and, and all of that and creativity and how you how you harness that within an organization but at the same time you use it to move forward as opposed to maybe you know get all scattered yeah well um thank you again for having me and and being able to share these ideas with your community i first started to tinker with these ideas around wonder and rigor as I was getting invited into companies to help them build cultures of innovation. And as we were throwing around the I word, as I like to say, we seem to be oftentimes missing each other. People had different definitions of innovation. And sometimes it would lead to what people call innovation theater. And I had the sinking sensation that we were starting in the wrong place. I realized from my perspective that we actually should start with creativity this creativity is the engine for innovation. The challenge, of course, is that in most of the hallowed halls of corporate America, if you use the word creativity, people think look at you like you have three heads. And I realize that's because you don't really understand what creativity is. People um, silo and isolate creativity as this mysterious talent that only artists are imbued with, when in fact, to be human is to be hardwired to be creativity. And I write a lot about this in my latest book called The Creativity Leap. So what I then realized I needed to do was to come up with a simple and accessible definition of creativity to dispel more organizations and more people from this idea that, oh, I'm not creative if I can't sing, dance, paint, draw, etc. So what I landed on was a definition of creativity, which is that it's about our ability to toggle between wonder and rigor to solve problems. And I expand, extended that to this idea of the three eyes, which is the way that you can consistently operationalize and activate creativity. And those three eyes are inquiry, improv, and intuition. All right, good. Uh, so, um, so tell me, so the idea of creativity, I totally agree with you. It sounds so esoteric. It sounds so like up there. Uh, but everybody has to be creative every day in their jobs. I mean, pretty much everybody's problem solving on a daily basis. And that requires often a level of creativity. We may not call it that because it may like just be, oh, I solved a problem. But that's being creative. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And if you think about creativity as this idea of toggling between wonder and rigor to solve problems, um, then you realize that the best engineers, the best salespeople, the best accountants, lawyers, teachers, fat farmers, and plumbers are super creative when they are being intentional about toggling between wonder and rigor. And let me just break down what each of yeah. those divisions of creativity is, because some people still think, oh, wonder has nothing to do with business. Um, the more I started to research wonder, I learned that some real intellectual heavy hitters throughout civilization have given a lot of credence to wonder. So for example, Socrates said that wonder is the root of wisdom. So if you actually want to become wiser, you must in, in, engage in the work of wonder. So wonder is about audacity. It's about awe, pausing, deep curiosity. I often remind people that you cannot wonder when you're going 80 miles an hour. You have to slow it down and you have to pause in order to really do the work of wonder. So we have to design both space and time for wonder. 
uh, rigor. Yeah, let, let me oh, just uh, I, let me just ask you on that for a moment there because I I'm, I, I really like uh, what you're saying here. But you can uh, again you can think of it in the context of most businesses. All right. So sometimes in in organizations, right? If you saw somebody sitting around, kind of staring off into space, and you said, "What are you doing?" and they said, "Well, I'm wondering right now. I'm being I'm I'm being creative. I'm thinking. I'm being curious and everything." I mean, it probably wouldn't go down too well in most places because we're hardwired for activity. We're hardwired to be in constant motion. And to be perfectly frank, I think we live in a world where uh, people have become somewhat intellectually and uh, lazy and, you know, intellectual curiosity isn't as, isn't celebrated in the way it should be. I agree with you, but there are some companies that actually design the space and the time for what other organizations may look down upon. So for example, in one of my recent Fast Company articles, I wrote about something I call invisible work and how invisible work is actually the key to our most productive selves. And one of the companies I reference is Patagonia, the out, the out, uh, outerwear company. And many years ago when I was a professor, I used to teach a class called apparel sourcing. And apparel sourcing can be a kind of a dry topic. So I, I um, I was always looking for ways to make it more interesting for my students. And one of the books I found as kind of the primer for the course is the memoir of the founder of Patagonia, a gentleman named Yvonne Chouinard. And the memoir is entitled, Let My People Go Surfing. And it's called that because one of the principles and values at Patagonia has always been that if an employee enjoy surfing and they realize that later this afternoon between two and four surfs up and that's going to be my time to play in the ocean and then i'll come back and do the work at hand there's a level of trust in that sort of management style and leadership style to let people be fully human to embody work with physicality and we don't we, we often forget that the brain is connected to the spinal cord we disembody our brains. We show up to the work, to our work from the chin up, maybe from the heart up, but definitely not from the gut up. And that is what is actually really required, especially now in this fourth industrial revolution, where automation, artificial intelligence, robotics will be taking over basic tasks. We're not going to need humans to do basic tasks. We will need humans to do that great regenerative reimagining work, which is best actualized when we're not sitting still in a cubbyhole all day long. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's a it's a great point, and and I just want to reiterate that point you made about uh, the connection between you know the brain and the body, mind body connection. Um, it's unfortunate that you know, we've grown up in a world, and and you know uh, the medical industry have a lot to answer for on this too. Is the separation of you know, you go to, you know, you, you go to your doctor if you've got a pain in your arm, you know, you go to a psychiatrist if you're not fit, if you're not doing well or a, or a therapist or whatever, and they don't really communicate. I mean, they're separate things. And so you separate out, but it all has to, I agree with you, it all needs to work together in order to be, to be successful. And you're right. If you're sitting at a desk, to, you know, five days a week, just sitting, staring at a monitor, it's not going to be conducive to being really creative. No, it's not. And there are a lot of casualties in this fourth industrial revolution. It's not all uh, bunnies and roses. It's not all going to be fun. There's going to be a lot of people who lose their jobs, who will need to figure out how to upskill and reskill. And at the same time, part of the opportunity is to say, OK, we don't need people who are sitting at a monitor all day uh, doing kind of mundane tasks because we will have automation that can take over that. Where is the opportunity? to allow humans to show up fully human, fully creative in the work so we can expand our work, and make it more productive. The organizations who do that, who lead with creativity, will actually be the ones that flourish and the ones that attract and retain the best talent. Yeah, and I think we're also, uh, we're also entering a, a, a unique phase as well because obviously we, you know, we had COVID and a lot of people ended up working from home and a lot of people ended up uh, working in different ways, maybe reconnecting with their families. You know, there's so many different changes. And I think it's now it's going to be the challenge to see how organizations going forward can can be more creative in how they structure their business and their working conditions and all of that. And and almost a new social contract between employer and employee saying, you know, if you give me more of that freedom to live where I want to, 
you know, maybe change my hours a bit and all of that, I will give you 150%. Yes, and that requires a very different management and leadership style. It requires uh, people, as, as my colleague Warren Berger says, who's a big proponent of leading with questions to seed control, not S-E-E-D, but C-E-D-E, -E, which is terrifying for most managers and leaders, this idea that we um, can actually build uh, higher productivity if we don't micromanage, if we macromanage, if we identify the goals, the end result that we need, if we co-create, even co-create the end result and really co-develop the questions that we need to explore, whether you're working in manufacturing or crypto or healthcare or education or food and bev, if you um, relinquish that amount of control because you realize that people actually want to be seen and heard. And one of the best ways to do that is to um, allow their creativity to flourish. Yeah, no, and, and I agree. And I think this is going to be a big, big challenge for, for a lot of organizations because it is going to require moving away from more traditional ways of of managing more traditional ways of organizing. And like I said, I mean, it's not all the onus is not on the company. It's on employees, too. I mean, you have to if you want to create a new way of working, if you want to work in a different way, then, it, you know, the onus is also on you to to show the company why that's a benefit. Yes, and um, you're absolutely right. The onus is on on us as individuals to to suggest, to ask for new ways of working, to come up with our own ideas and recommendations about how that works best in our particular working culture. And that requires a lot of shifting of our own mental models because a lot of the way, ways we've been educated is that we've been educated in ways to fill in the dots. Um, what do you want me to do? I'm waiting for your next directive. And um, that is, a, this. we now need a very different way to show up to work. Yeah, you know, I think that's a great, I think that's a great point is uh, that if you're going to ask for flexibility, you need to be flexible too. So yes, yes, <laughs> careful, careful what you want, careful what you wish for. But the other thing is too, is, is, is Natalie, what I find really fascinating, again, coming back to this idea of, of wonder, is that we live in a, in, in, a, in a society today, we're so bombarded, we're so distracted, like people say, I'm the busiest I've ever been. And I say, no, you're not, you're the most distracted you've ever been. There's a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we're bombarded from the moment we wake up in the morning, just bombarded with, with, you know, social media, with news that provokes you rather than informs you, all of this stuff, right? Uh, so we're not really setting ourselves up to be and and society isn't reinforcing the idea of, of wonder of taking time out to think and i think if something if if something really good came out of the pandemic i think it's that more people were forced to spend some time alone with their own thoughts i agree i'm a big proponent of solitude um it's actually a commitment to myself in the year 2022 um, I had a really great year in 2021, oddly enough, and um, as, a, as a gift to myself, actually in the encouragement of my husband, I gifted myself a, a personal solo uh, two-night retreat uh, up in the Berkshire area in New England. And um, I came out of that feeling much more restored, feeling very excited about what was ahead. I was able to be very reflective, and I decided that I would commit to doing this once a quarter. And it doesn't have to be an expensive retreat. It can be visit, spend a day, it doesn't even have to be overnight, spend a day visiting a different, walking through a different neighborhood in your community. If you have the money to book yourself into a nice hotel in your own city or a nearby city, order in room service, do that. But the time to be reflective along with your thoughts, do some reading, fiction especially, Fiction is really a great way to build curiosity. Curiosity is the precursor to empathy and it's super relaxing and it recharges your imagination and you come back to work very fulfilled. So solitude is not something that we should be scared of or something that we run away from. It actually is an opportunity to reconnect and recharge. Yeah, and I love what you just said there about uh, you know curiosity being the precursor to empathy because empathy is another word that's getting thrown around a lot right now. There's yes, two big has. buzzwords, authenticity and empathy, right? They're getting thrown around all the time. Be more authentic, be more empathetic. Like, great. Uh, I don't think you can actually force yourself to be that. But I think there what you outlined a moment ago is start with curiosity. And yes. that will lead you to empathy. 
Yes, in my view, curiosity is the currency of the future. It is, you cannot empathize with a soul until you have paused to wonder and ask yourself, why do they do it that way and not our way? Why, what if we tried it that way? Um, why do they sit over there and not over here? If you don't even ask the question, you actually don't have the capacity to empathize with other people. So it all starts with curiosity. Yeah, no, I love that. I love what you said there, because sometimes if you actually ask those questions of the people, probably a lot of the times you go, mm, I don't know why we do it that way. I yeah, it's why. true. <laughs> I don't remember why we were sitting over here. So in, in fact, you may not just not just for yourself, but now you've prompted the other people to start thinking about it. And there now you have a connection point. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, so Natalie, before we go, what's one other, what's one other um, thing that you'd like to emphasize around, around wonder and, and creativity and, and just the, the future of work? Well, that it is all, it is totally within our capacity and our ability to exercise our creative competency. Yes, it is about wonder and it is about rigor. It's important for people to remember that yeah. creativity is not doing whatever you feel like. One of the reasons I suspect that we don't engage in more creative processes is the level of ambiguity that we must steep ourselves in. It's hard, it requires that rigor to sit with a problem, to fine tune your skills so that you figure out how to bore through it and navigate it. So I, I, um, I actually just wanna leave people with the thought that I, I wrote about in that Fast Company article. Um, and I'll, I'll share the, you can share the link with, with your listeners. Yep. Um, but, but it's really that engaging in that invisible work for 80% of the time will help us to synthesize uh, the output that's going to lead to real breakthrough. And I hope people will read The Creativity Leap. Yeah, yeah. So again, The Creativity Leap, Unleash Curiosity, Improvisation and Intuition at Work. It's available Kindle, audiobook, paperback. All good booksellers, I would really encourage you to check it out. Uh, all of the information will be below the video here as well. Uh, before we go, Natalie, just tell people a little bit more about yourself and uh, and what you do. Sure. Well, John, thank you again for inviting me to share. I'm uh, a, the CEO of Figure Eight Thinking. You can learn all about my work and the projects and services and experiences that we offer by going to Figure Eight. Thinking, that's the number eight, figure eight, like ice skating, figure eight thinking.com. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter. Also follow me on LinkedIn. I share a lot of great content on those platforms as well as on YouTube. Thank you. Fantastic. Yes. And by the way, um, Natalie also has a, a Wonder Rigger card deck. I love these. I, I talked to somebody the other day who had a card deck for something you know completely different, but I love the idea of card decks. I think they're very... Uh, I don't know. They're, they're, if you like, it's kind of old technology, but it's relevant. If you know, it's what I mean. you're right. It's analog, and it begins to catalyze that thinking. So, th thanks for referencing that. Yeah, there's the Wonder Rigger card deck as well. Yeah, absolutely. So all the links to everything Natalie Nixon will be below this video. But listen, thanks again for joining us, Natalie. Thank you for watching and listening, and I'll see you all again very soon. Thank you, John. Yeah.